there's probably interest of folks joining from across across the world. Um, and I'm so happy that you also mentioned that, you know, this is sort of a follow on conversation from Severe's uh, sort of initial conversation about um, how we can collaborate with ITC and um, and you lo you led in with, you know, a topic of a lot of the work that's coming out of, of Severe is um, on the cusp of, you know, leveraging more machine learning, AI and deep learning approaches. And from that, we've we've developed this TensorFlow working group and um, my talk today is really going to focus on some of the capacity building components of that TensorFlow working group and knowledge sharing as well. So um, I'm going to go ahead and move forward my slides and just I'll get a check real quick if you guys can see that they're advancing. Hopefully they've, yes. they've moved forward for you. Um, so with my talk today, um, I'm hoping to really touch on what Servere is and maybe for the ITC folks on the call, maybe this is review, which is which is fantastic. But my hope is that we're also drawing a little bit more of a broader audience as well, so I can talk a little bit about what Servere is and then also focusing on capacity building, really sort of our bread and butter of of Servere and really within NASA's capacity building program really our focus and then dialing in right on the TensorFlow working group, you know what we're doing on the cutting edges of machine learning and AI and then talking about a lot of applications of of those different methodologies into different services. And then I'll wrap up the presentation to talk about opportunities and leave some space for discussion as well. So hopefully um, this is a good roadmap of, of what I'll talk about today. So. Um, I think a perfect place to probably start the conversation is to better understand who Servere is. Um, and really from the US government side, uh, there's two um, organizations, the US Agency for International Development and NASA, and they have a joint initiative together, which really formed Servere. Um, and I sit over with the with the NASA folks, and really what we, we provide to this joint initiative um, is the 30 plus years of Earth observing data. Uh, we have a really strong um, science portfolio, and which I'll touch on in just a little bit. And really to the, the mission of, of NASA is to utilize our, our, our scientific expertise uh, for societal benefit uh, for both space exploration and Earth observations. Um, and with USAID, you know, they have an international field presence um, they have expertise for uh, regions that uh, often have really scarce data, um, but they have uh, not only an international and a, a local presence, but they also have uh, direct connections to, um, you know, improving resiliency in those locations. So that's sort of the overarching um, side from from the U.S. government of of how Severe sort of came into fruition, and then how we interact. On the global scale, is we also have uh, direct collaborations with regional hub institutions, and really these institutions have existed for a, a very, very long time, and they're they have a strong expertise of providing knowledge and backstopping at a at a regional scale in uh, in South Asia, for instance, in in Latin America, in in the Americas as a whole, in Africa. So listed at in this middle column here in this middle row i should say is all the different hub institutions that we work with so like adp so adp for instance is the asian disaster preparedness center located in in thailand and they have a very strong expertise in disaster res resiliency um working right alongside um governments and ministries to provide near real-time flood information and weather modeling etc cetera, etc cetera. so within that severe ha has folks working alongside those uh, institutions to provide more geospatial technology, uh, improving some of the services, um, and really dialing in some of the capacity building components. And then working alongside those regional hubs um, are more consortium members. So, you know, maybe one of these organizations is really focused on land cover, for instance, um, and will bring in more expertise with maybe a water portfolio, uh, someone like Deltares, who's got a fantastic expertise in water. So um, there's a consortium model that's also exists within a lot of these uh, focused regional hubs. And then also at the at the top, I wanted to talk about um, Servier also brings in a lot of private sector collaborators. So for instance, um, Servier has a lot of expertise working with Google. I know the the talk of the this overarching talk is a lot about TensorFlow, which is a Google product, um, but we have a, a strong expertise with and um, 
experience working with Google and development C, for instance. So often we we rely upon um, some of their platforms, some of their technology, some of their experts. And likewise, in that collaborative focus, we we also do a lot of testing with these um, with these private groups and uh, deploy a lot of different tools as well. So it's a it's a great partnership being able to work with uh, a broad array of private sector folks. And then, as I mentioned at the top, you know, from the NASA side, uh, we also have a portfolio of 20 different applied scientists teams out of universities and in the and research centers in the US who are providing cutting edge technology um, really plugged into those different different uh, hubs as well. So right now, for instance, at the HKH region, the Hindu Kush Himalaya hub that I focus on, we have four applied science teams that are developing new technology, leveraging new uh, applications, um, and that's really coming from the, the NASA side. And then moving across the, you know, the the U.S. government, we also work with a lot of different agencies, including NOAA, USGS, uh, U.S. Forest Service, and of course, because it's an international project, we have many inter intergovernmental NGOs that we uh, we collaborate with. You know, uh, chiefly probably the FAO on, on a lot of the applications that we've been de developing for years. And then, um, really, I wanted to highlight some of the universities that we work with, and in particular, ITC, great partnership that uh, we hope to work with going forward and, and uh, incorporate in many of our um, applications. Um, and we, I also wanted to touch on that when we go and do trainings in region, we often really have a lot of conversations with universities in region. So we want to make sure that if we go and do a training on SAR forest sand height estimation, for instance, we're incorporating not only the hubs, but we're also incorporating some of the practitioners from ministries, but also university professors and students. So incorporating a lot of um, the universities as well, universities as well in that conversation. So that's a, a very broad sense of who's a part of the Severe network, and that's really what we are is, is a broad network. Um, so now um, here's just an example of where we're at across the globe, and I'm from the Marshall Space Flight Center at the Science Coordination Office. Um, but the main focus at, that I really that I really dial in on is is the Hindu Kush Himalaya hub, which is based out of ECMOD in Kathmandu. And uh, as you can see, we have many countries that we we work with and we collaborate with um, in in uh, developing our. Uh, uh, can you guys hear me? I think I got a little bit of feedback. Okay, so with uh, with just a short amount of time, I also wanted to, to sort of talk about you know uh, some services that I'm really familiar with, uh, and this is from the HKH region in particular, and I've highlighted two that um, uh, you know are, are perfect test beds for machine learning, deep learning, AI. Um, these would be the regional land cover monitoring service and some some river and uh, hydrology um, disaster response work. Um, so if you're interested in any of these that I've listed um, and some of the ones that I'll talk about as well, um, feel free to go to the service to the severe service catalog and it provides links to all these tools, use cases, videos of how to use these tools, uh, data sets, testimonials, et cetera. So it's a it's a great collection of all the different services across all the hubs as well. So um, I'll talk a little bit about these services, but I just wanted to highlight that, you know, down to the regional level, we have individual services that can be test beds for machine learning and AI. So I'll, I'll take one step back out and say, across Servier, we also focus on thematic areas. So even those services are broken into thematic areas, and uh, we have four main ones, which would be agricultural food security, water and water related disasters, land use and ecosystems, and weather and climate. And a new service area that is just starting to, to blossom is air quality. We're spending a lot of time and a lot of energy on, on developing uh, air quality monitoring services and incorporating some cutting edge science from um, some of the, the NASA, science, NASA centers as well. So this is really sort of where these services line up. So I've talked quite a bit about, I've used the word service quite a bit already, and um, that's sort of maybe a, a, a terminology that's uh, 
really associated with Severe. Um, and really what we mean by this is a service framework. So to, to dial in or to, to really talk about what we do in the TensorFlow Working Group, I think it's best exemplified through our service framework. And we can see here, starting on the left, this is how all Severe services really come into fruition. Um, and it starts with needs assessments with stakeholders. And really, if you think about this, um, for instance, with the HKH region, folks from ECMOD have a great relationship with government uh, ministries, with local end users, with um, USAID in-country uh, missions. Um, they have a great expertise of, of past relationships, of working collaboratively with end users. And for instance, the, the issue might be we need re near real time inundation alerts to get people out of harm's way if there's a flood. Um, so that's the assessed need in this example. And then it moves into this service concept and design phase where um, folks from the from the regional hub will work on how we get this service into something that can be actionable. And then there moves into this co-development phase where we bring in more information from the end users, specifically what do you what are what is needed to get this off the ground. Then there's more expertise that's maybe brought in from other NASA centers or other subject matter experts um, and, and an effort to build a service, to co-develop it with all the different parties to make it as strong as it possibly can be to answer the question. And then going into the delivery phase. When that service is ready to be rolled out, we often accompany it with capacity building material, which could be trainings on you know, the remote sensing principles. It might be um, the infrastructure for how to leverage this tool um, so that the ministry can, uh, can have it running on their servers, for instance. Um, so we have a lot of components that build around the service with all these um, service uh, and capacity building service oriented trainings. So those happen in the delivery phase. And then after all that, we do an, uh, an assessment of how effective was this service in understanding and addressing this environmental challenge to folks in region. And we do another needs assessment and we, if needed, we go back through the process again. So all of the severe hubs are doing the same process to better build services and really dial in the uh, the service generation process because we want to make sure that the tools that are being developed are really really crucial for uh, the end users so that's in a broad sense of how we're developing these services and the tensorflow working group uh, i'll map that into there as well but um, that's sort of what i'm talking about when i say service so in a taking you know a, a few steps back as well um you know sort of why uh we're going about this work is you know Within, the Na when, within NASA's Applied Sciences, we sit within the capacity building program, uh, Servere does, and really our mission is to, to build capacity to leverage Earth observation data, uh, not only at institutions and in civil societies, um, and really at universities as well. So our main focus is to really build this knowledge base on how to use Earth observations to answer questions. So it fits directly into um, this service um, development framework, which I just talked about, is it's mapped directly on to our mission at the capacity building program within NASA. So with um, usually I would have probably more up to date photos, but you know there's been a, a, a pandemic, so these photos are just about a year old at this point. But I wanted to showcase uh, a couple examples of you know in person trainings because those are probably the most tangible, right? We can go in region, we can sit down and talk about Vic modeling, or we can talk about uh, forest stand height estimations, uh, et cetera, et cetera, air quality. Um, so here's examples of us actually going out and providing in region trainings and working collaboratively with folks. Like I said before, incorporating university um, experts and talking about their methodologies and bringing in our methodologies and uh, finding some synergy there. But beyond just the in-person trainings, we're also providing more publications, contributing back out to um, you know the the scientific community and remote sensing community, um, making sure that we're we're providing that material. And also, I wanted to mention that um, Servier has taken a lot of effort to produce. Um, 
technical material such as the SAR handbook, which is really a, a, a comprehensive um, a comprehensive guide for anyone who's trying to, to leverage SAR for uh, forest, tan, forest monitoring or biomass estimation. So how do we use SAR to answer particular questions? And here's a, a great collection of material that anyone can pick up and run with. So um, we're providing technical material and publications and in-person trainings in addition to a lot of the other things that we're doing as well. And the, again, the goal is really um, focusing along with the, the capacity building mission of, of providing that uh, opportunity to, to grow skills in uh, Earth observations. So with the, the other portion of my presentation, I really wanted to talk about the TensorFlow Working Group um, and who we are and uh, how it maps into that service framework. So I think that probably the best place to start on the, the TensorFlow Working Group is sort of how it came into fruition. Um, so this is probably not the most comprehensive timeline, uh, but I think it's for the slide itself. Um, we can probably just start in August 2019. We had uh, at the Marshall Space Flight Center, we, we pulled in a lot of expertise from across the hubs, uh, across the private sector, uh, across the NASA researchers who um, are focusing on land cover. We all got together and we talked about what are the needs on land cover? Where do we see the field going in five years? You know, what are the applications that we're missing? You know, how do we how do we stay on the cutting edge? How do we incorporate more technology? How do we get prepared for cloud computing and um, and leverage new applications? And um, that was the main part of that conversation is awareness and uh, a sort of a visioning experience. And then jumping a month forward, we had 20 individuals from the Severe Network who went to Google headquarters and participated in the Geo for Good event. Um, and part of that is that um, Severe has been developing services on the Google Earth Engine platform for years. We, uh, you know, one of the major things that Severe did at the onset of the release of Google Earth Engine is uh, they were one of the first organizations to really jump on to that technology and and provide services and the rationale is because you know in many parts of the world it, it's very difficult to have um, uh, a lot of bandwidth for leveraging um, different uh, different approaches that rely on you know high high bandwidth internet for instance so something like Google Earth Engine is a perfect tool for our team to leverage and we built a lot of services that rely on Google Earth Engine. So we went to the Geo for Good event and presented a lot of those uh, examples of, of Google Earth Engine tools, but also as part of that um, experience, we were a part of a build-a-thon where we worked on how to use some of these services, but inject some deep learning approaches, specifically TensorFlow. So we had a full week of just focusing on how to incorporate more technology more um, deep learning approaches into some of these services that we're really familiar with. And then fast forward a week later, we did a full um, TensorFlow technical exchange um, at University of San Francisco, um, working with experts from Google, experts from um, the machine learning um, sector. And, and they came in and we had a, a lot of conversations about how do we improve our services? Uh, how do we test a lot of these deep learning approaches and you know where can we go from there? So we had a lot of like dedicated energy towards um, focusing some of the development with um, uh, deep learning and, and artificial intelligence. So from that, we then established a TensorFlow working group. And really, the TensorFlow working group is an opportunity for all of us across the globe. You know, we have all these di disparate time zones. We have um, you know different portfolio, different services that we work on. Um, but it's an opportunity for all of us to get together and meet twice a month to to just talk about deep learning, to test different deep learning approaches, to invite presenters to come and talk about their research. You know where they're going with their research, different applications, um, and really provide a forum to have these in-depth conversations about deep learning and applied science. So that's really the, the genesis of the TensorFlow Working Group. Then speeding a year forward, we had a technical exchange that really, um, it, obviously it was virtual, it was during 2020, um, but it was an opportunity for us to meet again for one full week and 
you know, hack to do a lot of the development to invite a lot of uh, expertise and and grow our knowledge. Um, so that was the main focus of the 2020 event. And then we presented again at the Geo for Good event, all of the work that we had done for the past year. So all the teams that had been working on a specific project using a specific service that they've been developing some of the TensorFlow workflows in, then presented again at Geo for Good. Um, and then most recently we had at the Servere Annual Global Exchange, the SAGE event, we get all the different parties from across the, the hubs together to talk about you know, what's going on in Servere, how can we move forward, what's the next steps? And one of the main topics that we talked about was machine learning, AI, and, and deep learning. And from there, we targeted some, some uh, next steps forward. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But here's a long timeline of of what we've done in the Severe group and how we came to be. And I provided a little bit of example of what we do on a, a bi-monthly uh, basis, but that's really sort of the core of you know, some of the researchers who are in this group and the forum that we use it for just conversations about what we're doing with deep learning and uh, use it as an avenue to get expertise into our group as well. So uh, I, I know I've touched on quite a bit about sort of the programmatic components of, of the TensorFlow group, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention how many different organizations are within the group as well. It's not just severe folks. We have university individuals. We have a, a really uh, big selection of of um, the private in, uh, private sector as well. Uh, expertise from uh, Radiant Earth, for instance, and Cloud to Street. Um, those are, a, a, you know, a collection of um, uh, researchers who are part of this group who are, you know, presenting and um, providing expertise and, you know, acting as a sounding board and working in a, in a collaborative uh, format. So it's a very, very broad group. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, we, we do a lot of inv invited uh, speakers as well, which I'll talk about. So, you know, I've talked a lot about, um, you know, Severe and our, our goals for capacity building and uh, now really focusing on the TensorFlow working group. You know, our goals obviously should be capacity building, and that's really what we use that um, that that group for is to have, have an opportunity for us to meet and talk about methodologies and talk about, you know, where we're going as a group and uh, if there's any gaps that we could be that we could be focusing on. So that's really the 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 number one goal of the TensorFlow working group. The second is to develop more applications that incorporate uh, deep learning, AI, uh, and machine learning approaches and use those as test beds. And then lastly, knowledge sharing again. And this figure here on the on the left, I think this is from Nick Clinton from Google. Um, he has a, a blog post that sort of showcased the the usage of TensorFlow. And as I mentioned before, a lot of our frameworks are built on Google Earth Engine uh, for some of these tools. And we we spent a lot of time in our working group talking about what's the most effective way to, to move around between Google Earth Engine, cloud storage, AI platform, deploy models, release them back onto the Google Earth Engine to be served out to uh, end users and region, for instance. And it doesn't necessarily have to be just TensorFlow in these conversations. It could be other AI and deep learning platforms as well. Uh, that's just sort of where we started and the, and the name stuck. But um, this that's sort of our approach of, of moving around the process of getting more exposure on cloud computing, uh, understanding the pitfalls uh, of, of moving around this triangle to get back to where we have models and uh, outputs that we can actually use as information to you know, help mitigate uh, flooding, for instance. So um, that's where we spend a lot of our time is sort of moving around that circle of how do we get products out? So those are the goals of the TensorFlow Working Group. And I know that this list may be um, uh, so a little bit overwhelming, but um, I wanted to be very comprehensive because hopefully I'll, I'll share these slides at the very end. Um, but Here's an example, I think, over the past eight months of various groups um, and hub teams that have presented at the TensorFlow Working Group. And again, we, we meet by bi monthly, and we often have presenters who showcase some of the work that they're working on, talk about the pitfalls, talk about the, the model specifics, you know, some lessons learned, et cetera. So it's a great uh, knowledge sharing forum. And uh, we have a TensorFlow 
uh, website, which is linked at the very bottom. Uh, feel free to check out all of our slides, all of our videos, all of our code base. We just, everything's open. Uh, feel free to, to run with it. Um, and I just wanted to maybe highlight a couple examples from here, but uh, we've had a lot of presentations on impervious surfaces, uh, crop mapping, mangrove mapping, um, gold mining. That's been a major topic that we've talked quite a bit about. Uh, a lot, a lot of focus on um, closed canopy uh, and forest uh, identifying uh, trees and and forest degradation. Uh, we had representatives from WRI present. Um, as I mentioned before, Radiant Earth. Uh, most recently, one of the most, a very interesting presentation from folks from Oxford and University of Bath on leveraging drones um, to identify wildlife and improve wildlife metrics and counting um, for, for their models. And that was a very exciting talk of like, what else can we do with deep learning that we aren't necessarily employing in our day-to-day -day, uh, approaches? So, Feel free, uh, once I share out these slides, to come back, click on any of these that you're interested in, uh, or check out our website. So, you know, where does the TensorFlow Working Group fall within this service development framework? And the answer is really, we 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 push ourselves into this service concept and design phase, the service co-development phase, and the service delivery, because we get together and have conversations about how we can incorporate deep learning approaches. We work collaboratively together in this co-development phase of you know, sharing methodologies, uh, doing some agile work of all meeting for a technical exchange and focusing on developing one or two services. And then we have a plethora of capacity building materials. So past slides, past examples of leveraging neural networks or a UNET or, um, you know, examples of uh, different methodologies that we have that can be really helpful when folks go in region to give a training. Um, there's content there that's available for for folks to use uh, in their in their deployment phase. So that's where the TensorFlow Working Group fits within the service framework of Servere. So with my remaining time, I thought it would be probably a little bit more exciting uh, to not necessarily talk so programmatically, but to focus in on a few services. And um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, all these slides are really coming from the researchers who are part of the Severe network and some of the folks who are uh, invited guests as well. And all these slides are linked, um, but we've had examples of of uh, mangrove mapping. Um, and this is from Katie Stratman, who's uh, one of the graduate students from um, the Severe Science Coordination Office, doing a baseline estimation of random forest, CART, SVM versus some of the, the deep neural network approaches uh, for identifying mangrove maps. Um, and that's been extremely useful in some of the existing services that West Africa has been already implementing. And this is a, a great opportunity to, to test, you know, using Google Earth Engine's framework, leveraging deep learning approaches, and then relying on Servere's Collect Earth Online system to do a lot of the point estimation. So a point to uh, end to end example of em employing deep learning into a service that already exists and doing an assessment of how effective uh, this approach is. Another example would be from the HKH region, this, this center column here of uh, understanding impervious surfaces using deep learning approaches. And this has been a great example of the team has come back to the drawing board multiple times in their process of understanding, you know, what's the best method for identifying impervious surfaces testing different models over and over again, trying new frameworks, trying new model configurations, uh, and seeing how those improve, while they also have an existing example of using the regional land cover monitoring system to produce um, uh, impervious surface maps to test against. So it's, it's a great uh, exploratory uh, example of how to use machine learning and, and test different methodologies. So those are two examples, one from West Africa, one from the HKH region of, of folks who've presented uh, at the Geo for Good event, presented at the TensorFlow Working Group, um, and shared their methodologies of, of lessons learned. So I have two more in-depth examples, and one is from West Africa again, um, and this is a recent article, I think was just published in Earth Observatory last week, um, and it was on their gold mining service that West Africa has been developing. 
And for the past year, we've been working with uh, a couple of folks from West Africa who've been a part, really fantastic contributors in the, the TensorFlow working group, testing out different methodologies of, of doing identification of gold mining locations that would eventually contribute to an alert system, which is the overarching service that's uh, deployed right now in West Africa. So at the very bottom, we've got an example of some of the slides that the team has been working on. They've got code base that they've been developing, a lot of conversations about how to improve their, their uh, detection service and how that contributes to their overall uh, product at the very end. So uh, if you're interested in gold mining, feel free to click on that link. Uh, we've got obviously, obviously the slides and some of the code base as well, but um, here's just an example of um, how, the, how this group has contributed to this overall 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 service that's already deployed um, and it, it's just a really recent win um, and then the another example I wanted to hit upon is an article that was uh, published in climate links from USAID and it's on uh, flood mapping in Cambodia and uh, Biplod was another great researcher from uh, Servere uh, he's got an example of some slides that he presented at the geo for good at the very bottom here and um, he sort of talks about utilizing the VGG-19 backbone into uh, mapping inundated areas in near real time. And um, this has been a major area of research for our teams. And that system all the way going across the bottom is then contributing to the World Food Program's PRISM system, which is using these near real time alerts to then provide information to the ministries of inundated areas, locations of of flooding, um, how to move resources uh, to be prepared, to be resilient to, to, to disasters. Um, so it's just a great example of we've done a lot of testing. We have an overarching, much larger system called hydro floods, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but we've used some of that space to play around, to do a little bit of research on how we can deploy deep learning approaches, uh, test different uh, methodologies and see how they they stack up against some of the other systems that we've got so that it can contribute to something like the 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 prism system that the world food program has right now so again if you're interested in uh, any flood mapping work feel free to click on that link once i share out the slides but it's just a really great example of um the hydro flood system and components of that, which are these deep learning uh, examples that have contributed to sort of the science development uh, and going from end to end again on um, some some ways to conceptualize, co-develop, and eventually deliver some of these components that contribute to this this larger service. So uh, I would be, I think I would be. Uh, missed the opportunity if I didn't have an opportunity to to showcase some of the 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 exciting technical components um, that are within the, this example um, because you know I've talked a lot about the programmatic components uh, of what we're doing with the TensorFlow working group but we also like to leave a lot of opportunity to have sort of technical discussions and and share methodologies as I've mentioned quite a bit um, but here's just an example from uh, Biplov's work of using uh, the VGG-19 uh, model that has a standard in, uh, encoder process, but then we've had a lot of conversations about making a customized uh, decoder and incorporating all of these different um, methodologies uh, and and initializers and normalizers, et cetera, in in this in, in this decoder phase here. Um, so this has been a major topic that we we bring into these conversations and we share methodologies. And this is just an example of you know one of the slides that uh, is is presented at, at the TensorFlow working group. And then we have you know, spinoff conversations about um, these different uh, pros and cons of initializers and um, incorporating dropout layers here and there. So um, a lot of technical conversations about um, the particulars of models and and what we do with those. Um, but it's this is sort of uh, an example of what we're what we talk about in the TensorFlow working group when we do those dedicated presentations as well. Um, so uh, lastly, I wanted to sort of talk about going in that round in that circle again of Google Earth Engine, cloud storage, AI platform, using the, the TensorFlow and CoLab uh, platform to do the AI and then contribute back out to Google Earth Engine. So we've uh, on the right hand side, 
I've got the, the workflow of incorporating all this Earth observation data and then moving into the cloud storage, doing the hyperparameter tuning and uh, all the components of, of these different trials that we were uh, testing out these different models, doing these head-to-head -head comparisons of these different models, and eventually contributing to this, this inference that goes all the way back around the circle to Google Earth Engine where the PRISM system can pick it up and deploy those, those inundated areas to in near real time to the researchers or to the uh, disaster managers on the ground. So um, just an example of how we sort of uh, talk about moving through the workflow, can contribute to each other and and um, spend a lot of time really talking about what's the most effective way uh, to move uh, through this process and, uh, you know, avoid a lot of pitfalls um, as well, because th there's there's many to, to be had. So uh, it's a great opportunity to sort of share our approaches and lessons learned as well. So. Here's just a uh, sort of a, an example of uh, a win and, and and how we've moved through that the process to go from Google Earth Engine all the way around back to Google Earth Engine to provide um, some products that have been really helpful. Um, so I've talked a little bit about the system as a whole, but again, here's Hydro Floods, the the much larger system that this work has been contributing to. And if you're at all working with uh, uh, hydrology or, or doing inundated inundation mapping, uh, please check out the system. It's it's open. Feel free to grab it, implement it. Um, we, we would love to contribute and work with you. Um, so if, feel free. There's uh, a collection of different algorithms that are within this system. And the, the one I just talked about kind of in detail about this deep learning approach is just another algorithm that we've added to the system as a whole to test against and uh, to see how useful it is, right? So um, there's a collection of papers. Feel free to check those out um, and the system as a whole. Happy to have a conversation about that uh, after the presentation as well. But um, if you're excited about any inundation work, uh, here's an example that we've been using uh, primarily in the Severe Mekong hub, but we've also been implementing at other hubs as well about ways to um, identify inundated areas, uh, even in, in you know leveraging SAR in particular uh, when it's very cloudy. So uh, feel free to check this out as well. Um, and then lastly, uh, as I sort of wrap up the the focus of the TensorFlow Working Group, um, we're also using this as an avenue to to create publications, which I sort of mentioned at the top. But um, you know, we're working collaboratively across the various hubs and really focusing in on you know what's new, what's novel, what what's a way we can contribute back to the scientific community um, with papers, and also you know. Uh, this helps to provide more credence for some of the services that we've been developing, uh, doing really dedicated validation trials, uh, testing it in different regions. Um, all that's really helpful for us to say, you know, that we have a lot of confidence in, in some of these services when we go and work with folks like the World Food Program, who, you know, it's to be frank, you know, they need to have very confident, they have to have a high confidence in their models uh, when they're making life and death decisions, right? So uh, we want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence and uh, providing a lot of the um, analyses through papers is a, is a great way to sort of build our institutional confidence in some of these approaches. So we leave a lot of space in the TensorFlow Working Group to sort of focus in on uh, some of these papers and where we where we could be going as a, as a group as well. So um, that's some of the things that are in the works and um, uh, on our horizon. So perfect segue, you know, what's what's on our what's on our horizon? What's next for the TensorFlow Working Group? Um, and really, as I mentioned before, we had the Severe Annual Global Exchange, this the SAGE event. And again, we had, you know, uh, probably 100 folks who participated in this conversation about what we want to do in the next year, two years, three years with this working group. Um, and from that poll, really, the number one thing is more dedicated uh, service development, more applications of machine learning um, into our services. So that's going to be the main focus of our group, then followed up by capacity building, growing partnerships, which is something like this event right now where we're um, having an opportunity to, to get a lot of voices in. So hopefully um, I'll have an opportunity to chat with a lot of you afterwards, but uh, getting more expertise into our working group, working more collaboratively with other folks who don't necessarily work in the same regions as us and get more expertise uh, injected into the TensorFlow working group. And then the fourth is methods transfer and concept sharing. And really that means, you know, from our conversation, it's 
more opportunity to get into person with one another and work in a in a dedicated uh, scrum to to develop more services. So uh, working in person is is hopefully going to be on the horizon for everybody. Um, but those are our main uh, sort of marching orders uh, as a as a group for the next few years is where we want to focus. So um, I'll start to wrap up and leave some space for questions, but the I. Probably the first question, if, if you're excited about any of this, is how to get involved. Uh, again, we meet bi-weekly, and the, the best way to do it is just to reach out to me. I spend a lot of time sort of coordinating coordinating this group um, and helping to shape our schedule of what we want to talk about. But we also have a Skype group, which the link is live and when I, when I share the slides, that you can join. We have a Mattermost channel, which is just very similar to Slack of um, any questions. And the these, again, are sort of a, a messaging board of, Hey, I've got a problem with this workflow. Here's my code base. How can how can I uh, get around this issue? And often there's folks on that group who who have that expertise that can uh, can help in a pinch. So the best way to join is to reach out to me, um, and we can get you in the group if you want to be a part of it. And also, if you're interested in presenting anything as well, if you have some workflows that you're you're developing on. Uh, deep learning, uh, some new platforms, some really novel approaches, uh, thinking back to the uh, leveraging drones for wildlife detection. We're interested in all methodologies that uh, rely on deep learning, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. So if you have anything that you're really excited about and you want to present, you're looking for a forum, you're looking for voices that are doing the same, feel free to join our group and we'll we'll welcome you with open arms. So uh, that's one of the, the main things that we want to incorporate is just having a lot of voices into our group as well. And just to wrap up, um, you know, the a lot of the content that I presented today uh, is coming from the Severe Network as a whole. So this is just a very small collection of uh, some of the folks that were at the the last in-person Sage event. Um, but it's really the the folks from the network who are who are developing this work, who are working collaboratively with each other uh, to produce a lot of the material. So I just wanted to to pause here and say, you know, the 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 greatest strength that we have as as Severe is the depth. And the power of our network. So um, hopefully, you know, if you're excited by any of this, this is just a great opportunity to work with some really dedicated researchers across the globe as well. So I'd be remiss if I didn't if I didn't mention all the the great expertise that's coming out of um, this the Servier as a whole who contributes to the TensorFlow Working Group. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I feel free to ask any questions and uh, I've left about 14 minutes for discussion. So um, I'll turn the floor over back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. It was a very, was nice, a very presentation, nice presentation, which provided which a complete picture, picture. Um, uh, about, about uh, your, your, uh, activities, your activities, starting from uh, Sarvir itself, but also how the working group fits uh, to a larger uh, picture, how it is formed um, and how it become, in fact, a, a success story. Um, so uh, now I want to open the floor for, for the questions. So uh, please feel free to, to write your questions either to the chat or you can also ask them directly to Tim. I see a, a comment from, from Peter. He says he sees a lot of potential in combining object-based image analysis with uh, machine learning in general and uh, also with TensorFlow in particular. He would be happy if he could establish a close co collaboration, particularly in this field. So um, I think that might be possible. What do you think, Tim? Yeah, I I mean, I everyone is welcome to join the group. So uh, if if you're excited by anything I had to say, feel free. We'll 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 connect. Um, and uh, I'm sure I'll get a list of everybody who's excited about the presentation afterwards and we can all collaborate. But um, if you're excited by, you know, any um, object detection, um, you know, leveraging planet data, you know, that's another thing that we're sort of um, talking quite a bit about doing a lot of transfer learning. Um, I only showed a couple examples of some, you know, of, you know, sort of wins, I guess, quote unquote, wins of 
of how we've gone from the beginning to the end of, of using some machine learning, uh, machine learning approaches and plug those into services. But we do a lot of trials of things that don't necessarily work, but they're great lessons learned. So uh, uh, we welcome all, all energy into the group. So uh, I look forward to collaborating. Thank you. Uh, there is one question, how we can apply for the membership? Uh, yeah, um, I will. I'll provide my email at the end. I guess is probably the easiest way. But uh, um, I just did it actually in the chat. Perfect. So yeah. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. If you're if you're excited, just email me. I'll I'll send you the meeting invite. Uh, I'll connect you into the to the group. And then you know the I think the best way uh, to be honest is if you've got some research that you're working on or you've got a research question. Uh, let's schedule a time for you to present. We're a very open group. Everyone, everyone presents at some point. It's a great opportunity for us all to get together and sort of share what we're working on. So if you've got a question in mind or some research that you'd like to highlight, uh, let's just schedule something uh, for one of our existing meetings, and that'll be a great opportunity to showcase what you're working on uh, and how the TensorFlow Working Group can, can hop in and help out with some of the work and um, maybe show some of the some of the tricks from our bag of like all the past work that we've done for the past uh, year, two years or so and say, hey, here's here's some examples of some pitfalls that we ran into as well. Here's some models that we've been developing. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, the best way is probably just to reach out to me and then let's let's find a time to to get uh, active researchers part of that conversation. Thank you, Tim. I will continue with the questions, but very, very shortly. Can you tell us when will be the next meeting? Because these are regular meetings, right? We weekly meeting. So when will be the next one? And maybe uh, people can already mark it in their calendar. Yeah, certainly. So the next meeting is they're Wednesdays and uh, they're at 10 a.m. Central Time. So I know we, it's it's the most difficult thing I think about the whole thing is not doing this really in depth. Uh, you know, capacity building on uh, leveraging machine learning or uh, cloud computing, it's managing time zones. <laughs> That's the most difficult thing, uh, which is a, a, an easy hill to, to climb, but we, we meet at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, and because the U.S. also does uh, daylight uh, savings, we, also, we often adjust it as well. But um, uh, I'll, I think our next meeting is a week from it's in eight days in eight days so um if you're interested as soon as you, you know feel free to message me and i will send you the invite uh it's a reoccurring meeting invite and then we also on our tensorflow website uh, which i put together there's uh, a calendar uh, which has all the upcoming events um and then we can talk about you know if you want to present um what con what's what works for your schedule um that's another conversation because we have some existing presentations on the horizon too that we want to leave space for thank you um we have a question from professor M M mia in fact three questions so i will try to summarize um or i'll please um uh, feel free to ask also directly if i miss something but the first question is whether uh, the, the the tools that you develop, the services are are open source and accessible publicly. And uh, the second question is from that point of view. So, uh, in fact, um, open science principles or open being open also uh, is a good way to uh, to to facilitate uh, capacity development activities. Uh, so, what do you think? Uh, using a partly closed system for that purpose, because Google Earth Engine is, is a very nice uh, platform, has a lot of features, capabilities, but uh, at the same time, it's it's a closed system. We don't know exactly how it works, and it is also changing uh, pretty rapidly. So you learn something, but in fact, in, in a very short time, maybe um, the APIs, the functions, the, they are changing. How do you see this? Um, in terms of capacity development activities, because you teach people, but they when, when they want to, to use something, it will be changed. And the last question is about um, deep learning from that point of view, because um, deep learning um, solves many problems, but at the same time, it is partly also diffi difficult to, to explain people, right? So what do you think about this? Well, I first off, love the series of questions. This is the, the exactly uh, sort of the, the dialogue that we want to have in the TensorFlow working group. So yes, um, to answer the first part of the first question, I think, and I, if I might need to map back, um, 
I think, you know, part of the the driving force with NASA and with Servier as a whole is everything has to be open source. It just it has to be because we want it to be replicated. We want it to be adapted uh, and we want to share it to other parts of the world. So everything that we're developing, we're trying at every step to make it as open and as accessible as possible. So all those uh, links I provided uh, in those slides, which you'll, you'll 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 be able to get, uh, you know, all the slides are open, all the code base is open, all of those are examples of of you know we want people to use it, we want people to test it, we want to gain more insight on some of the pitfalls of it. So we're trying at every opportunity to to be open source uh, and make it accessible for folks. Uh, to the other the other side of that question with Google Earth Engine, yeah, there is components that we we don't know what's going on with some of these algorithms that are baked into uh, the platform, and it, it is moving quite rapidly. Um, I'm just thinking of some of the like the random forest uh, algorithm that was built into Google Earth Engine is it's already sort of changed its terminology, and there's been some some new rollout as well, and we don't really know what's going on in the back end of that. Um, so that is a big caution. Um, uh that we i would say we're we're comfortable with a degree of of um not knowing the exact components of it because it's a it's a it's a balance right where we we have a mandate to provide services and um work with uh disaster agencies for instance to to answer a question of flooding um so our first goal really is as severe as a whole is to provide the geospatial services to answer some of those questions. Um, and then second to that would be how to improve the knowledge sharing with um, open source access, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So really we're comfortable with the fact that we're able to use Google Earth Engine to answer all these questions. And then hopefully we're going to spend more time on um, you know, understanding the back end, maybe trying out different methodologies that aren't di directly tied to Google Earth Engine, uh, because you know, our, again, our hope is that eventually we'll have uh, just a strong expertise to to provide services that ne don't necessarily rely on Google Earth Engine, but we're really really happy with that uh, that system as a whole because it provides you know great access, um, data sharing, et cetera. It's it has many wins against some of its losses. So it's sort of a, a cost benefit analysis to some degree. Um, but um, from a research side, yeah, we're still we're still very happy to try out different platforms. Uh, and I, I know our group, I said in the presentation, is really titled TensorFlow Working Group. But uh, we, again, we really welcome other, uh, other avenues to explore as well. Um, and uh, forgive me, I, I know there's more to that question as well. I don't know if I, there's other points I missed. Well, there was the last part about deep learning. So uh, basically, it is hard to interpret and uh, explain also to, to other people. So uh, how do you see this from capacity uh, development uh, activities point of view? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so, you know, that's a I think we spent a, quite a bit of time talking on, you know, some, sort of the methodologies, the, the prerequisites for the TensorFlow Working Group. On the, the page, on the website as well, we have a prerequisite page. It sort of is a collection of all the material of, you know, working through like a Google uh, deep learning, machine learning boot camp, uh, testing a lot of the different uh, preliminary models in CoLab to get comfortable with those different workflows. So those are examples of sort of base building, capacity building to get into the conversation about how to use these approaches. Um, and I think that's a that's a huge hurdle for a lot of folks, uh, and that's kind of where we want to be as a TensorFlow working group is right on that cusp of you're a practitioner, you want to know more, um, but you're not necessarily an expert. And we welcome experts into the group at all the time to provide an injection of new technology, new approaches, things to avoid, uh, things to to be looking out for. So. Um, as you know, we've done two technical exchanges, which are across the, across the globe, um, and we're bringing folks in to, to have those conversations. And we're trying to develop these tracks where we have, you know, total novices, never used any machine learning in their life, um, and they want to they want to become experts, right? So we'll make a track for folks like that, and then we have people who are hardened experts who do it every single day. And how do we get them together in, in a little bit of a marriage for a week to talk about that? So we, we're doing sort of a, 
approach where we meet bi-weekly and we talk about the different approaches and then we do a technical scrum where we get all those groups together and talk about deep learning and talk about applications. So um, to answer your question, we're, we're going multifaceted. <laughs> we're trying to get all, all the parties in together to have that conversation because to your point, it, it is very complicated and there's a lot of pitfalls and a lot of things just get glanced over and as like, uh, oh, this is such an easy thing. Just just implement this, uh, this optimizer and walk away and, you know, wipe your hands but there's a much larger conversation that needs to happen there right there's a decision as an analyst you need to make so uh trying to leave that space in the of that conversation thank you very much tim um uh, we have a technical question which is simply uh whether deep learning for SAR data is possible in google earth engine yeah so we we have uh that uh uh, Hydrofloods example that I, I showcased, uh, we're using SAR uh, for doing some of the inundation mapping. Um, so it, it's been a, a great learning curve of, of how to pull in this SAR data uh, and, and work through that workflow again to get back to the Google, Google, Google Earth Engine inference uh, phase. Um, and to be frank, you know, one of the things that we learned is that the SAR data that was available in Google Earth Engine didn't fit the bill for what we were trying to do. We actually had to go and pull it uh, from ESA and do a, a RTC processing in our own pipeline to then port into Google Earth Engine. So that way we felt comfortable with the data to begin with to then pull it into um, our machine learning approaches and our and our deep learning nets. So, um, you know, we, we just use Sentinel-1 to begin with and then we realized this isn't the right process. So, you know, these are the conversations that we're having in the TensorFlow working group of like, Okay, we've got these available data sets. How can we implement them? How can we utilize them um, and, and move forward for something like uh, inundation mapping? And another example on the front end of that project was, you know, we have all this data for, um, you know, known flood locations, and how can we automate the process so we don't have to spend any time developing um, training data sets? Uh, and that's a huge conversation, right? Because these these models are so data hungry. Uh, and we don't want to spend our life <laughs> training models uh, and 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 doing a, a, a data point collection, right? So how do we automate a lot of those components as well? That that that's where we spend a lot of time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there is a question about the slides, uh, so we will share the slides uh, after, after the presentation. You will have also the links and hopefully we will also have the recording so that if, if necessary, you, you will be able to watch it again. Um, Tim, it was a very nice one hour. Um, um, I want to ask the audience whether they have other questions. Maybe we can have one or two short questions. Otherwise, I have a short question and uh, with that, maybe we, we can we can finish, but I'm sure uh, many people will contact you afterwards. And my question will be about um, TensorFlow Working Group uh, looks a very nice example of a bottom top approach. So basically people who are doing the actual work start with this initiative. They convert it to, it to a regular um, re regular uh, activity. Actually, B weekly meetings at the global scale is sounds quite complicated, in fact. And we saw that there are also many uh, very nice results. So many publications, active tools, use cases, etc. So um, based on this experience, what would be your 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 suggestion or or, or um, yeah your, your suggestion to people who want to have a similar initiative in their own organizations? What are the tricks or what are the things that you learned on the way? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, I feel like I'm still learning every day. So, you know, my answer may change in two months, but <laughs> I would say where I'm at right now, the, you know, the one of the biggest learning lessons is incorporate experts at every turn. Um, because, uh, you know, we may be running into a bottleneck as a group over and over and over again. Uh, and we, we as Servier have, have uh, great access to some of the experts in, in Google. Uh, just from our past experience. And uh, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of uh, services built on Google Earth Engine. So bringing in voices to solve some of the issues that we've been flagging uh, is a great way to sort of keep us moving forward. And I guess that's sort of the larger point that I'm trying to make is that um, with a group like this, 
the best way to keep morale high, keep excitement going, is to be always moving forward. So there's a new initiative that we're, we're rolling out. We're bringing in a new expert every, every month to talk about with some of their research. We lay out some tracks of some papers that we want to work on, and we set targets. So um, we have technical exchanges that we'll go to and we'll get together and we'll work on specific projects and we'll set some goals from that we'll work from on those um, so that's a really great metric we also um, have been presenting at the geo for good event which i talked about in the timeline and that's an opportunity to say hey there's other people doing tensorflow work we have a collection of tensorflow let's get in that conversation let's let's present with them let's be part of that conversation and then we can come back to our group and learn and talk about what you know what's the next step forward so we do a lot of outward facing components uh and that's again that's a, a metric for or a, a method for us to keep moving forward as a group uh, because it's very easy when it's um when it's international and it's so many time zones uh, for people to just sort of get lost, you know, the other things come up. Other people have work that's happening. This is sort of a uh, a pleasure of just being able to spend time on machine learning uh, that doesn't necessarily fit into any job jar. So we got to carve out that space um, and and make it worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. In COVID era, actually, all of us get used to have this kind of meetings, right? So you are now <laughs> at 9 a.m. in early in the morning. We are late in the afternoon. I'm sure there are people who joined uh, late in the, in the evening. So finding a proper time is really something quite quite complicated. Yeah. Um, Tim, thank you very much uh, for this very nice um, presentation. I hope it will uh, be the starting point for further collaboration between ITC and NASA servers. Um, many topics, but especially uh, for uh, TensorFlow uh, and at a greater extent machine learning and artificial intelligence related tasks. Uh, we have, in fact, many uh, colleagues working on those topics. So uh, maybe next time we can also do a presentation to you uh, about our, our activities. Um, uh, we will send the presentation and the links uh, later on. Um, if somebody wants to try TensorFlow, so one way is definitely Google Earth Engine, but we have also a geospatial computing platform that is available. And on the platform, we have, in fact, TensorFlow, uh, TensorBoard, uh, the extension which you can use in a vi uh, visual way, and also other uh, related packages. So uh, feel free to, to try to use the platform to learn more um, about TensorFlow. And you can, in fact, maybe use the resources uh, that are available on the Tensor Workflow Working Group web portal. Um, thank you very much. Uh, hope to hope to see you again later. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great facilitation and fantastic conversations and questions from everyone. And hopefully, I'll see you all at the TensorFlow Working Group. And I can't wait to work more with ITC. So thank you all yes. so much. You said in eight days, right? So we should be smart. Days, yes. <laughs> <You're>, reach <laughs> out to me. I'll, I'll include you in all the invites, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.